Hi there. Oh man, I've got something great for you today. Here's an interview I did with John Dolan. He is a, a advertising, editorial, wedding photographer. He's the very best in the business. And he most recently did um, Gwyneth Paltrow's wedding and he's shot Will Smith's wedding. He does family pictures for Jerry Seinfeld and his wife. So he is the real deal. And uh, he's a favorite of mine. I was so lucky to get him on the line. I've been a fan of his for a long time and we finally met face to face in, two th in 2020 at Photo Native where he came to be the keynote speaker. So I think you're really gonna dig this. He's as good as it gets. Please enjoy this interview with John Dolan. Thank you so much for doing this. I'll just start making my way through these questions. And Let's to go. start with, I'm curious, what led you to photography in the first place? And I know you started at a very young age, like you were 17 or something. Uh, the main thing is that I was a collector as a kid. So I was collecting stamps, coins, baseball cards, newspaper clippings, and essentially photography is collecting. So mm. it was a natural thing for me. It, the camera uh, gave me that control over what I was collecting. Whereas before that, I was just kind of finding things. I grew up near DC, uh, and so all the museums were something that I went to as a kid. And that the evidence of life was really fascinating to me. So as soon as I, I found the camera, I realized this was a way of carving time into little bits. I got the bug quite early, and I was a terrible student, always looking out the window. So the minute I found photography, I was really 16, got the driver's license, would leave school at you know 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and just go out and shoot. It was really about finding a way to, to bring something back from the world uh, mm. anytime I'd go out. You said it's evidence of life, and I love that. You discovered it early and loved it. You fell in love. And at what point did you determine this would then be your career? Uh, I think for me it was... Uh, it was the only thing I was good at. So I've met a lot of people over the years who gave up as professional photographers when the going got tough in their 30s. Um, I had no other way to make money. So uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but literally photography was that one thing that I was better at than anyone else in my group. So it, I wasn't a good athlete. I wasn't a great uh, academic. I couldn't write that well. I you know, there were so many things that I didn't get positive reinforcements with, but the camera gave me that, um, the passport people talk about, or that the way for me to um, use being a shy, quiet kid to make my mark. Uh, I have kids who are in their early 20s now, and I see that they're always looking for, or I'm help, trying to help them find that one thing that gives them strength. and. Uh, for me, it was the camera. Are you still a shy, quiet kid? Uh, I'm certainly an observational person. Um, mm. And I've, uh, at this point, I'm way too old to be a quiet, shy kid. But, <laughs> uh, but it, took me, it took me a good long time. Uh, I, you know, I'm definitely more comfortable at a wedding being the photographer than being a guest. The camera gives you a purpose. The camera gives you a reason to concentrate and to, uh, to watch carefully, watch body language. Um, one of the things I love to do is to watch people breathe. So even if I'm watching a baseball game and you see it's at the bottom of the ninth and the pitcher is up and you'll see, you can, the cameras are so good now, you can see them breathing or holding their breath and mm -hmm. you can see the hitter who's completely relaxed and then boom, home run. You can see that the edge is with one or the other. So, you know, there's all these skills that we learn as photographers to walk into a room and to sense what tension there is in the air, or you do it when you do a portrait of somebody, you get a sense right away, how am I gonna put this person at ease uh, or leverage that power play between the the viewer and the uh, subject. And uh, so it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of funny life skills that I've gotten from mm -hmm. photography. I'm sure you have as well. You, you mentioned this, there's just not very many 
wedding photographers who last 30 years in this career. There's not very many that go 10 years. Why is that? Why do, that's not the same with doctors or lawyers. Why is it that's, that um, someone gets in a career as a photographer and just doesn't last that long? One of the things I've realized lately is that wedding photography is not a business the way we think it is. And we shouldn't, the way I've approached wedding photography is not to be professional and corporate and buttoned down. It's that I realized that it's such an intimate role. It's such a personal job. Uh, the way I treat my clients is not like the way I treat my advertising clients or my corporate clients. It's, it's as if I am their personal chef or their trusted advisor or it's something so counterintuitive to the way we we're trained in the photography world to be. Um, so I think I've done it. You know, I answer, uh, if I get an inquiry from a bride, I'll say, let's talk on the phone. I don't have forms on my website saying, tell me about your wedding. What's the date? Like, this is an interpersonal relationship we are entering into and we better like each other. Uh, across the board in, in all the ways I'm doing business now, and because I only look for 10 great weddings a year, uh, I want that to be a connection and a, um, it's really a relationship that starts as strangers and ends up as something really intimate and we are all connected. My couples and I are very connected at the end. To answer your question, the, the real thing is that weddings take a lot out of you and weddings fill you up. And when I get back from a job, my wife always asks me, how are you still standing after three days and wherever? And I'll say, because I was filled up so much by the experience um, that I could take the whatever drain, you know, physical drain there is or mental drain. But um, it's, you know, it's, we're always trying to get something out of our work. And it's that, that fulfillment of making pictures that last and, uh, I think I was really lucky. I'm realizing it now how lucky I was to begin before I knew what I was doing, before what I knew what was cool or what the professional way to do things. So I'm able to stay a little bit naive or uh, this unprofessional, innocent, simple, whatever it is. Uh, uh, the connection to the people I photograph is it's very real and very, you know, I shoot, I'd say 50%, 70% of the weddings I shoot by myself. So I think that makes me, uh, it treats, I treat my clients in a whole different way because I'm, I'm there, I'm sitting at a table full of bridesmaids or sitting with the guys at the bar. Uh, I'm not a vendor. I'm a yeah. guest at the wedding with a camera. So um, your answer to that, that previous question about, why people get out of it early on and what I guess that's also the answer of why you're still in it 30 years later is because you get a lot out of it you're specifically your your clientele is curated so that you have a really strong relationship and you get so much out of it that's what can that's how you've allowed to or been able to keep going it's it's a it's a holistic approach which is I'm fascinated by weddings. I'm not trying to be a wedding photographer. I, my whole mindset is um, these people have asked me to come to their wedding on this day. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have a shot list. I don't have a plan. I don't have a team coming with me. It's like, I wonder what's going to happen at two o'clock. These two families coming together and it's like a mystery pl playing in front of me. I kind of know what's going to happen as we do. We know the plot, but I don't know. I'm surprised at each wedding. And I, it's really this, the map of starting out the unknown. And then at midnight or two o'clock in the morning, we've all been through something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. That's what I look forward to. So it's very distinct, um, like a, joyride or uh, <laughs> jumping out of a plane, uh, you know, parachuting out of a plane together or something. But it's, mm. it's that I leap into the unknown with people who trust me. And that trust has already been established. First time I meet them, first time I talk to them or 
when we do an engagement shoot, I never used to do them. And then I started uh, embracing it mostly as a way for us to have a meal together and me read their body language and, you know, get to know them a little bit. But so when I arrive at the wedding, they're kind of old friends. They're very happy to see me. I'm happy to see them, but it's, uh, it's that the unknown, embracing the unknown and the uncertainty is the fun part. And it's also counterintuitively why I don't get nervous shooting weddings. Mm. I think a lot of people, you know, I kind of lean into my, whatever anxiety I have, uh, I lean into it and go, this is kind of exciting. <laughs> What's gonna happen? I, I worry about, you know, whenever I talk about how I do it, I understand that it's not easy. And I always encourage people to do a wedding for a family member or a friend for free uh, or a healthcare worker, whatever it is. You know, I think the, the joy of going to a wedding where you have no responsibility is immense and the freedom to do that because you need to have some experiences where you're not trying to please the mother of the bride or please the bride or please the planner. And yeah. by nature, a lot of freelancers are pleasers. And that's, that's the biggest thing I have to kind of encourage people to do. Just do it for a friend, just show up and just don't care and just shoot freely and the results will thrill you. You have described your style. When I heard you at photo native, I wrote down a note that you described it as, um, a sophisticated snapshot. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? What's a sophisticated snapshot? The definition, I've been reading about uh, snapshots from my mentor, my college professor, Michael Simon at Beloit College in Wisconsin, wrote a whole essay about snapshots. And the essence of a snapshot is that neither party cares too much. The, the, per, the, mm -hmm. the grandmother taking the portrait on Easter Sunday there's nothing, there's no money in it for either side. It's, there's kind of innocence to it and it's kind of folk art. And uh, um, do a cover for Vogue. I'm, uh, I'm trying to, there's a certain innocence to, and truthfulness to it. And when I'm not trying hard and the bride and groom are not trying hard, there's something kind of just there. There's it's kind of simplicity to it. So it's that lack of direct, I'm not a director not my wedding it's not about me it's a it's a kind of uh less the less hard i the less hard we all work the better does that give a little explanation to it yeah and again because i've always just really liked your approach and it sounds a lot like what kent miles talks about i mean that just really resonates with me i like that a lot and it also is how I came into photography because I, I was pretty committed to this before I ever thought I would do it as a career. Right. And that's a key, that's a key point because from what I've, the people I've met in the last five years are not necessarily photographers first. People saw the, that uh, the paths to photography were shrinking, but the wedding photography road was getting wider. So as I've watched it, you know, 20 years ago, you could work for free weekly newspapers or magazines or get your head, uh, get your foot in the door. And then the last 10 years, I'd say weddings were that stable way to pay your rent and, you know, it's kind of fun. You get to meet nice people. <laughs> 30 years ago, I don't know if you remember, you were probably in grade school, but uh, weddings were extremely uncool. And it's a, it's, it's, I think it's important for people to know that the, the eighties wedding photographers were uh, not respected. And, you know, I shot my first wedding, I think in 87, my brother's wedding. And then 90, mid nineties, I really started fast and furious, but being a photographer first, then coming to a wedding, you already have all those technical chops and, uh, it's sort of all second nature. Um, I think a lot of people have learned by being a second shooter at weddings and mm -hmm. then they get kind of trained in, you know, all those bad 
habits and uh once you get that it's it's really hard to break out of that so yeah that does i i think that is clear to me your um explanation of a sophisticated snapshot and on your um instagram you sometimes tag things as the imperfect and you wrote that great essay on your blog the imperfect can you talk about that is it is it a similar approach what is the imperfect <clears throat> How are you using it? For, for me, it's, it's what I started to see when I would see these wedding picture of the, the wedding picture of the year would be a couple on a cliff in New Zealand at sunset and the photographer had gotten a helicopter shot and sky's incredible. And for me, I just thought that seems to me to be putting incredible amount of pressure on couples uh, that they want to achieve this on their wedding day, even though that was shot six months before the person's wedding. No. It's still, I saw this pressure building on people that their their wedding needed to be magazine worthy, blog ready, uh, needed to have every shot done in this perfect way. And people kept saying, I, I could see the pressure on brides at their weddings if something started to go wrong. So, um, I started just kind of throwing it out there that, you know, uh, I've been married 29 years. Marriage is not perfect. It's meaningful, memorable. It's lovely. It's compromised, all these things. Why should you expect your wedding day to be perfect mm. and, uh, or the best day of your life? Like uh, I've had three kids. Those days were kind of great. Normal Saturday with family is, is the best day of my life. So I thought, let's try to relieve the pressure where everything is just photoshopped to the T and you know, it's, it's my way of just kind of just pulling the air out of it a little bit and saying honest is great. Uh, showing some truth is great. I'm not a hyper realist. I'm a romantic. I'm, uh, but I thought as of, you know, as watching the industry from the mid nineties to now, I thought, well, maybe we've kind of created a monster by hmm. um, by showing these beautiful pictures in magazines that creates this false ideal, this kind of Disney version, and it's not fair to people. So, uh, and it's also a way for me to attract a certain kind of client who doesn't want uh, doesn't want perfection. They don't care about perfection, and they want uh, honest pictures and it's really lovely to find your people. And I recommend everyone know who your ideal client is and go for that. Uh, it's much better to shoot 10 weddings for people who really trust you than to shoot 20 weddings for people who doubt you. Do you say no to, you, you, someone calls you, you said you, or emails you and you say, well, let's get on the phone. Do you ever have a conversation and you are the one who says, you know, it's not a good fit. It's a, funny kind of self-selecting um i mean i uh, i charge a lot so that weeds out certain people and i say i have some other friends if you like my style i can recommend um or just through talking to them if they i hear them say you know some of your pictures are kind of blurry or <laughs> some of your what uh, if they ask for certain things I can tell that they're not my couple. If I meet them in person, I can tell within the first 10 minutes whether we have a match or not. It's an yeah. amazing thing. It's a very uh, kind of physical, uh, simpatico thing. And that's why I think it's really fantastic if you can find a way to meet people. Uh, and I don't know how I say no or turn them down or something, but I kind of, uh, if I get a bad feeling, maybe I'll say, I'm on hold for that day. Let me get back to you or something like that. But I mean, yeah. it's, it's all like dating, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned blurry pictures because I have a question specifically about that. When does that work? When does a blurry picture work or, or when does it not work? It's all about emotional truth. It's all about that thing. Does the picture bring you back to that reality? Uh, do you, when you see that picture, do you feel what it felt like at that, on that day at that time? Um, and if it's, 
there's unsharp, which is less good. <laughs> there's, you know, there's different levels of blur. I, I don't do any tricks to, uh, to make pictures blurry. It's more that um, if I'm sometimes, if I'm excited by a moment, I'm shooting so fast that I don't have time to, I'm either slow shutter speed or my body's moving fast. I move a lot while I'm sh while I shoot. Mm. So I'm not one of those people who stand super still. I'm constantly kind of dancing and swaying and, and in motion as my style of shooting. So uh, I will shoot first and focus later. And, uh, or if there's a little bit of camera shake, it's usually because something thrilling happened for just that 60th of a second. Um, and, you know, I still shoot a lot of film, probably 60, 70, 75% film. And film has beautiful blur <laughs> from my point of view. And I use some toy cameras on occasion too. But, but it's really, if I really look at it, if it's a non-toy camera, if I'm using a real camera, a Leica or something, the blurry picture is often that, moment where somebody who never smiles smiled and i was like <laughs> just throwing the camera at it to to get it or you know whatever it was but it's it it has to be that immediate and imperfect to make it feel good yeah and that's one of the funny things about the imperfect is i can often have two pictures next to each other the sharp version or the perfect version and the imperfect version and you know there's just no question that the imperfect one has that s spice or that soul or that little bit of, uh, of reality or narrative or something in it. Yeah. There's a story about Duke Ellington. I don't know if it's true, but it's passed around. And someone said to Duke Ellington, allegedly, um, how do you know if a song is good? And he said, well, if it sounds good, it is good. How do you know? If a picture's good, how do you know for you? What is it that says this is a good picture or this is a great picture? That is so good. It's such a good question because it's, I am so fast these days when I, you know, because I live in the country, I get the film download from my lab and I get it and I'm, you know, fidgety for it like Christmas morning, yeah. going through them and going, no, 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 yes. No, no, yes. No, 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 no. There it is. Like, it's it is a it's just a it's a reflection of how I shot, which is while well, I'm shooting I'm I'm looking for it I'm looking for it and it's not there and then it's I I get it. Um, the older I've gotten, the better I've the more times I'm getting what I had hoped I got three weeks before that moment, um, but. It's, it, it's inex absolutely inexplicable, but boy, I feel it through my veins when I see it. And it's because it's, it's surprise. It's something it's a little bit surprising. It's a little bit unexpected. It's a little bit, uh, that's squeezing the juice out of the moment. You know, it's a little, a little essence of, of that, brief time when that thing happened on that Saturday night. So there's, um, there's a surprise, there's, uh, there's something that's unexpected and you can't really define it. You're just feeling it. You just know, you just know based on experience and what you're responding to that that's the one. Yeah. I mean, Cartier Bresson had these seven words, which I don't remember all of them, but balance, uh, humor, surprise, whatever it is, it's, we all have our own little cocktail of what makes a great picture. But, but for me, it's, it's not the picture that, it's not that first easy picture. It's not the, you know, we can all get the good picture. But what, what I think you're asking about, what I'm always looking for is on the EKG would be those. Bleep. Yep. And that's what it is. And it's, it's like, this is ordinary, this is ordinary, this is, this is extraordinary. Yeah. Or I think it's a, a real challenge with digital because everything, uh, the cameras are so good. You can just fire away 5,000 pictures and get lots of really good pictures. But what we're talking about is this picture that 
only I could have made because I invested this, uh, my soul into the relationship with these people. And I was on the edge of that moment and it had been, the trust had been built up. You know, I, I aim really high at weddings because, uh, I mean, not to sound cheesy, but I know I was put on earth to shoot weddings and I have a finite number in me. So it's like, each wedding is a live sporting event, baseball metaphor, whatever you want. It's like, I know I have eight hours at this wedding to get, make something extraordinary. So, you know, I'm really uh, at war with the easy shot and at war with the ordinary and the expected. It's just, it's, and, and you know, the counter to that always is when people say, you know, aren't you afraid of missing something? Is like I'm afraid of delivering boring pictures. <laughs> that to me is just like, <laughs> no. you know, I'd rather take the risk, aim high, and get something, get twelve extraordinary pictures than five thousand safe shots. Yeah. Thing is like I'm afraid of delivering boring pictures. <laughs> that to me is just like. <laughs> no. You know, I'd rather take the risk, aim high, and get something get 12 extraordinary pictures than 5,000 safe shots. Yeah. You're, hearing you talk about this, it makes me excited to go shoot a wedding again. I want to go shoot a wedding. But uh, when you're at a wedding, can you walk me through your thought process? Like, what are you saying to yourself and, and what are you looking for? You know, if someone was in your head during a wedding, what would they see and hear? Can you walk me through that? That's great. It's a great question. It's uh, step one is this um, the ten minute nap before the wedding, um, where I have all my bags ready, everything all set, and then I just lie down and empty myself so that I can enter that house empty, enter enter empty and free of preconceptions, and and then I'm slowly kind of. Um, introducing myself metaphorically to people and making a connection before I start firing away. Um, if I'm at the bride's house an hour and a half beforehand, I won't go three hours beforehand and overdo it. Just kind of gracefully ease into the wedding and um, I'm making connections with the mother, the bridesmaids, the sister, the dad, um, and then I'm sort of hitching myself to the bride and less so with the groom, just because I think the story is richer with, with the bride, be, at least before the wedding. And then I'm just, you know, I'm just riding the waves with them at that point. So it's a, uh, it's the way I'm thinking about it is that I'm very protective of my couple, <laughs> I don't want people to throw them off their game. And I, I know everything that's about to happen. I can interact with the planner and know that we're 20 minutes late and behind schedule. I can move people along, but it's, you know, it's kind of like a, being a, uh, you know, from the Godfather Consigliere, <laughs> um, Tom Hayden, you, you know, it's like, you want to, I want to, just I want to be the intermediary in with everybody being stressed I want to be very calm and uh and graceful uh, yeah. and and photographically I'm I'm letting the story come to me rather than pounding away I think people work way too hard and they shoot so much before the, the people have even gotten to the ceremony and it's just a it's like a buzzing bee you know it's like so you know for me, it's a, the weddings are a three-act play. The first act is people apart. Then the second act, they come together. So, it, you know, take your time. Yeah. In one of your blog posts, you said that, you're, that one of your mantras is that your behavior as a photographer affects the photos. Explain that. Can you talk about that a little bit? I've certainly seen other photographers look like they are... Um, commandos or come strapped with cameras and they make such a, a big splash and big they're so noticeable that 
that that's not my style. My style is to be quite minimal and quite unobtrusive and uh, and just read the vibe of the party. So at each kind of uh, section of the wedding, I'm trying to be the same mood as that, uh, whether it's quiet at the church or loud at the dance hall, you want to reflect that. And I don't think that the pictures get better if I work really hard. I think it's if, if people are open to me, then the pictures flow. So it's a, it's a very, again, I go back to this thing of it being the opposite of how we're taught to work. You work hard, make a living. Weddings are this different thing. You have to, it's like you're going to a dinner party. How are you going to behave? Are you going to be the loud mouse in the corner telling dumb jokes? Or are you going to be uh, an interested guest who wants to get to know people? Um, so that's really the, that's really the most fun part in the last, I don't know, 10 years where I've really, I'm fascinated by watching people go through this very intense ritual and the older I've gotten, the more I started talking to the dads, the father, the bride, and you just learn about life. Um, so it's, it's that thing of how I am as a human being gets me hum more human photographs. That's great. I like that. Um, I did not think that's what that quote meant. So I'm glad I asked that and have you explain that. In another blog post, um, you wrote this and I, I need to read it. It said, this is the danger. When a good idea becomes a template, shoot like this and you will be published. You were talking about, um, about wedding blogs. Shoot like this and you'll be published. This encouraged people to follow a formula rather than to shoot freely and to make discoveries and take risks. Now, I love that. And, and one of the reasons why I loved showing your work to um, some of my students when we were talking about wedding photography is because it's just not repeatable. There's no way anyone could take that picture but you in that moment. And, and that's one of the things that I just love about what you do. But I'm, I'm curious, do you take any of the safe pictures or standards just to cover your base and you just don't show them? Or do you not take those pictures at all? I learned long ago to please the mother, the bride. It's a really big mistake to miss what's important to her, whatever that is. And you can do that quickly. But on the other hand, um, taking risks is really crucial. And I think what happened with the blogs is that um, people got into this loop that I described. And it seems to me whenever there's a loop like that, whenever there's a template, that's an opportunity for some brave photographer to do something different. So mm -hmm. I'm still surprised why other photographers haven't redone their blogs. Instead of saying John and Mary's wedding, here's the shoes, the rings, the invitation, whatever the template is, completely blow it up. Instead of having 50 pictures, have 10 pictures. It's why I've started doing on my blog, a wedding in 12 pictures or wedding in 15 pictures, just to, show this idea that it doesn't have to be so predictable. I mean, I do, uh, I, when I'm doing family pictures, I cover them. Um, I mean, I do it all a little bit, not haphazard, but I, I do it all pretty loosely, mm. but I cover my bases at the same time. I mean, I've done this at 300 weddings. I can do it. I can do it, <laughs> yeah. but I, I wouldn't want to encourage anyone to play it safe. I, I think people are going to naturally play it safe. I really encourage people to, to have a glass of wine and to jump in the middle of the dance floor, or to sit down with some cool people at a table and just put your camera down and just, you know, ask how did they know the couple or anything. Mm. How's the chicken or shrimp or <laughs> <laughs> chicken or beef? Do you, do you work on um, long-term personal projects? Um, I'm not one of those. Uh, I'm not, I'm not that kind of photographer. I've done a few, I've done some long-term commissions, which I love, but I'm very reactive. And um, so it is a tricky time right now because 
there's no <laughs> no reacting going on but um but i've I, I mean i've tried to build this career of a uh, diverse client client base so this thing of having i'd say for 20 years i had a mixture of magazine work advertising work and weddings and one would go down and the other would go up or bring in some corporate, some lawyers, some family portraits for celebrities. You know, I, the mix was what's most interesting to me because each one informs the other one. Um, now I do more nonprofit work upstate where I'll go, uh, I work with this foundation, we'll go out and we'll do 10 different organizations in a day. So, uh, you know, a, an old folks home and then uh, elementary school and then a animal shelter and you know, do a bunch of things. And, um, and that's just, it's great to know the community and it's great to shoot fast and just mm. shoot for them. So uh, I, but I don't have long-term projects. I just like that. It's not, I'm not doing the same thing every week. How do you feel about doing work for free? And I don't mean, you know, someone who could pay you to shoot a wedding wants you to do it for free. I don't mean that. Like, um, you know, maybe um, a neighbor's parents are dying and they don't have a good picture and they want you to, or like people ask you to donate a print or a session for an auction, or I, I don't know what different scenarios are, but do you, how do you feel about doing anything for free? Uh, one of the things that's on my blog, but it's kind of way down was a wedding I did for somebody in our community. Um, a young woman had cancer and she had this small window of when she could get married. And uh, so I flew out to Buffalo and shot her wedding and it was the most extraordinary three hours ever. And um, she's doing great now, but it was the essence of what we do as <clears throat> photographers. Um, you know, the moment during the ceremony when they said in sickness and in health, and you see this woman, uh, what she's gone through, it was, absolutely magical and they appreciated the value of having photographs of this tiny six person wedding mm -hmm. and um uh so it put everything else in perspective when you get a big wedding that's you know uh, it just really boiled everything down for me so i i highly encourage that and i think i think there's I also have a really strong feeling that's going to be the future weddings for the next six months or a year that a 30 person wedding is going to be the norm and they're going to be fantastic. And it's really a question of how photographers are going to embrace that if they don't have the normal set of events to cover. Mm. Um, and I've done a few of these weddings where there's 20 people at dinner. What are you going to do? And you kind of have to just lay back and, capture the pixie dust that's in the air and um it can be a little frustrating because there's not the turbocharge of a big wedding but our job is not to lay something on top of the wedding it's to reflect take away what we saw at the wedding yeah. where the you know you're the intimate witness to an event so uh how do you i always ask people if you're coming home and telling your partner uh, about uh, what you saw on Saturday night, what would you describe? And do you have those pictures that match that uh, magic in the air? That's really wow. the question. That's a good way to approach it. So I've asked you a, hand, a bunch of um, sort of theoretical questions, but now I have some kind of practical nuts and bolts questions. When you are at a wedding, do you ever use um, anything other than natural light? Do you ever light the scene? And if you do, how are you doing it? With a strobe off in the corner or a speed light? Or what do you, do you ever use a light? I have a $50, uh, a little tiny flash I bought on eBay. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the extent of it. I have five of them. Do you put it on your camera or is it off the side? Um, I, I'll do it on camera. I just for on the dance floor for really close up. Yeah. And then uh, you said that you shoot about half or 75% on your own. So do you sometimes take an assistant or have a second shooter? 
I have a second shooter. I don't use assistance. I can load film faster than anybody I've met. And I'm up for a challenge if anybody wants to do an online challenge. I almost got beat <laughs> by my buddy Saul, but um, I'm still unbeaten. <laughs> you shoot um, a lot of film, mostly film, or a good portion at the wedding is film. I'm really curious about your, <laughs> your file management. How are you collecting and keeping? What does your database look like? If I called you and said, I need an image from a wedding 15 years ago, can you find it? Anyway, walk me through your file management system. So this goes back to uh, 20, 20 years ago. I, I uh, got an office with two other photographers, Philippe Chang and Holger Toss. And both of them had worked at Magnum. So um, they taught me the Magnum system, which mm. is... It's easier to show you, but um, you basically have a spreadsheet. And on the spreadsheet, we call it the master story list. And every year you start your master story list, um, listing your jobs, one, two, three. If you do a portrait of the, your neighbor, that's a job. If you do a portrait, uh, if you do a wedding, that's a job, magazine, each one gets a number. So 2020 dot, 01, 02, 03, down, maybe I shoot 60 jobs a year. So every wedding only has a two digit number. So if I do a wedding in July, maybe that'll be 2020.35. So that number, job 35 gets connected to everything, gets connected to my film, my contact sheets, my digital files, my invoices, my folder for that company or for that wedding. And the thing is that it reduces everything to very simple two digits because I've seen over 30 years, I'm a little bit dyslexic. If I have an assistant who's dyslexic, negatives can get out of whack. Yeah. So each roll number gets, uh, say I brought 50 rolls of film, 2020.35.01.02.03. Digital files get the... Uh, get a code for whatever camera it was. If I'm using a Leica, I just made up this code MD for M digital. So 2020.35.md.01.02. So everything is really simple. All I need to do is go back to that spreadsheet. If you want something from 15 years ago, I'll type into the spreadsheet uh, Justin's wedding. I'll have your name on the spreadsheet. I'll have client location, contact information, you know, simple things. Yeah. But, you know, so easy on Excel to search for Justin. Then I'll find you. I'll say, oh, you were uh, 2005.32. And once I get 0532, I've got it all. Gotcha. So, so basically what it does is reduces the number of digits Add it to as few as possible. I have, a, you know, I worked for somebody who did year, month, day, roll, and it was too many numbers. Things would get, handwriting would be bad. Something would go wrong. Yeah. It uh, people put them in subfolders by date and by stuff. The, I've worked this out over twenty five years. It is a flawless system and just simple, 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 and be really strict with it. And then how are you? how are you archiving your negatives? Um, I just pulled some negatives right now. I have filing cabinets. I have six foot tall, 12 foot tall stacks of filing cabinets, 30, 30 years of negatives. And this, so right here, it just says 2017, 50. Uh, so I just had to dig this out for somebody. It took mm, me two minutes. Nice. Um, and I'll put it right back in. Uh, and I use Lightroom and um, I use keywords and you know, give three or four keywords for each photograph. And um, I, do, I make a new Lightroom catalog for each job. And then I will move maybe the 50 best pictures into my, my big 
catalog of favorites. Gotcha. So I only see my only see my best pictures. <laughs> so I feel good about myself, but I have the full edit somewhere else. But it's a way to just you know always be working, and it kind of goes back to my old days of baseball baseball card collecting where as a kid I would skip school a lot and I would just sit at home and sort my baseball cards just my favorites and I'd make these all-star teams and that's basically what I do in Lightroom all day I'm making edits of my favorite um, editorial jobs or weddings or you know it's all about um, sorting and finding the gems and after the wedding what are you delivering to the client? What do they get? Uh, 16 photographs. Are, are they, are they Mat- matted in a box? Matted in a box. Are they um, like optical prints made in a dark room or are they ink prints or? They're beautiful inkjet prints, beautiful uh, archival prints. Um, I also give them a contact sheet book um, and with my top 100 and a uh, flash drive with all the pictures. So they get a drive of everything. They get a, a book that shows your selected favorites. It's a contact sheet kind of thing. And then, this, and then 16 matted prints in a box. And are, do you select those 16? Yeah. And then if they wanted something else printed and matted, they can get it from you. Yes. Oh, that's a nice way to do it. I like that. Um, there's, there's a lot of stress in people choosing their pictures, so I choose them for me, for them, and uh, that seems to save a lot of pressure. Mm. We're running out of time. I have a couple more questions, but I'm curious about this. <laughs> so um, how, what's your criteria in selecting those? Just the ones you like. These are the good ones. Your gut, yeah. Mm. It's pretty um, clear, like 10 of them are clear. And then I, you know. What are the kinds of things you do to market yourself? It's such a word of mouth business. It's, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I did one mailer 30 years ago. And um, I just think that the best thing we can do is uh, at each wedding, uh, be open to people that, I think most weddings you'll get another wedding if you do a great job. Um, so, um, and in, uh, I was very late to Instagram, really, really late. And, uh, but I see that that's a way to, to speak directly to a lot of people. So um, don't try to please everybody, make your message clear. And um, I think that's, that's the best thing you can do. So what advice, if, if you had uh, if some new photographer who wanted to shoot weddings asked you, what, would, what if marketing advice would you give a new photographer for weddings? So if we use the uh, um, sort of metaphor of hunting in Africa, I mean, you go where the water buffalo are. <laughs> it's like you, uh, you, you find a group of people who are between 27 and 34 and you let yourself enter that group in some way and let them know you're a cool wedding photographer. And, um, it's, I just don't think that, uh, I just think it's incredibly, uh, word of mouth business. Why would anybody trust somebody from a website? I think people who, who choose wedding photographers, from a website or from Instagram are missing it. It's they should be meeting people in person or asking their friends, you know, it's not something you want to take a risk on. You want to have a really solid face-to-face reference. Um, So um, I've, I, I just always found it better to just how somehow put yourself in front of those people who are looking for you. Hmm. Be clever about it. Don't be traditional. I love it. Here's my last question, John. What book are you currently reading? Um, I'm reading a book about the early days of independent film, uh, like the birth of Sundance and that sort of stuff. And it's really interesting about how the early guys, Soderbergh and Tarantino, um, 
it was it's it's very similar to the wedding industry. The big studios were the monolith, and they were the insurgency, and um, that's what it felt like when I first started in weddings. And it feels like there's a kind of a new monolith, and there's opportunity for somebody to rip it and uh, try something new. That's what I'm I'm looking for. <clears throat> I'm looking to see some other photographers follow our footsteps and mm. and rip it. I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you so much. I'm going to probably at the end of this, um, put a handful of your images just um, so people can see, or maybe at the beginning, I don't know, but um, are you all right with me just screenshotting them from your site? 100%.